Jeff Wilson was a PhD student at UCI. He was also the first person that I interviewed for this series. Back in May, we talked about his new book on Shakespeare and Trump. Well, Jeff has been very busy, and now he has another book out, this time on Shakespeare and the Game of Thrones. So, so Jeff, tell us how you came up with the idea of writing a book about Shakespeare and the Game of Thrones. Yeah, so there's um, a few kind of uh, origin moments here, and, and one of them would have to be, I think, probably spring of 2007, when my first year of grad school, you just said, hey, let's do this small kind of group reading. So there was four of us there in the room, and you said, you all just pick the plays, and we'll, we'll get together and kind of chat about things once a week, really kind of fun, informal conversations. And so I was really fascinated with evil in literature at the time, and so I picked Richard III, and Richard III has just kind of guided so much of my thinking over the past however many years, because Richard III just shows up so much in Game of Thrones. It sh Richard shows up with Tyrion, Richard shows up with Daenerys, Richard shows up with Jon Snow. Can you just explain that a little bit more, how that works? Yeah, the, the Wars of the Roses is this bloody 15th century civil war between these feuding noble English families so you've got the House of Lancaster, which is then displaced by the House of York, and then they have power for a little while, and then they're displaced by this upstart House of Tudor. And so you've got the, the Lancasters, they're the Red Rose, the Yorks, they're the White Rose, and the Tudors, their symbol is the Welsh dragon. And so you can start to see how Martin is taking Yorks and making them into Starks and is taking Lancasters and making them into Lannisters and is taking Tudors and making them into Targaryens. Martin doesn't really tell the Wars of the Roses as much as he tells the Tudor myth. And the Tudor myth is the version that Shakespeare kind of popularized, this heavily politicized and a deeply mythologized version of this history. It starts in, in 1399 when the man who will go on to be Henry IV deposes Richard II. And the argument of the Tudor myth is this kind of starts this century of disorder and chaos in English royalty that culminates in Richard III, according to the Tudor myth, evil incarnate, assuming the English throne. And he reigns for a short time until the last Lancastrian knight, God's lieutenant here on earth, Henry Tudor comes out of nowhere in a, a war that Shakespeare presents as kind of one of good versus evil. He gets rid of Richard III, and then he unites these warring families by marrying the heiress to the, the House of York, and their child is Henry VIII, whose child, Elizabeth I, is Queen of England when Shakespeare's writing his history plays about this material. So I got excited by that, and I, I brought it into my course that I teach, which is called Why Shakespeare? And what I really love about this book so much is that it just kind of it started in the classroom with these conversations that the students are interested in. So the, the, the book is dedicated to the Why Shakespeare students that I've been privileged to teach over the past few years. Well, that's really great, Jeff. I really enjoyed the interviews with the actors. Can you tell us who you got to talk to and, and what did you learn from them? Yeah, I, I spoke with a few of the actors who have done both Shakespeare and Game of Thrones. So there's Conleth Hill, who's varies in the show, who's also been Macbeth. There's Anton Lesser, who is Quiburn in the show. He's also been a really great Richard III and a, and a Hamlet. There's Julian Glover, who is Pycelle, and who told me he's only not been in five of Shakespeare plays. One of the hilarious things that each of the three actors I spoke with said to me, they all said, I, I approach all roles the same. And then they went on to kind of detail the very big differences between acting Shakespeare on a stage night after night after night and acting Game of Thrones for, for television and for the camera. Glover especially was really hard on the Game of Thrones text. He said, it doesn't have the verse. It could never be Shakespeare. It doesn't have the verse. And I've been noticing now that some of them are returning to Shakespeare. For example, Gwendolyn Christie, who plays Brienne of Tarth in Thrones, was in the National Theater's post-Thrones Midsummer Night's Dream. And in that production, she plays both Titania and, get it, Oberon, in an interesting twist on the play's gender politics. 
And that production also drew very self-consciously on the recent media success of The Handmaid's Tale. So it's a quite interesting case study in this flow between Shakespeare and mass media, which you also see at work in Star Trek and Star Wars, for example. You're a UCI PhD, and there are some UCI connections running through your book. For example, you quote Michael Zelay on the opening sequence of Thrones. He writes that, quote, story emerges from brand equity as earth and rock emerge from magma or coins from molten gold. And you also quote Jerome Christensen on corporate authorship in film. He writes, quote, the studio, not the director, screenwriter, even, even producer, should be regarded as the author. And of course, showrunner David Benioff received his MFA at UCI. How did your time at UCI help shape some of the questions you raise in this book? There's a chapter in the book called Comical, Historical, uh, historical Pastoral, uh, Tragical. Um, and so, I mean, that's all. If you've spent 10 seconds talking to Victoria Silver about Shakespeare, you know the name of the game is genre. It's genre, genre, genre. The thing that Julie, I wanted to ask you about is I, I know you had David Benioff in one of your classes for a moment. Um, is, is that what, just what do you remember about that? Oh, wow. That was so long ago. Yeah, he did take a Shakespeare graduate seminar with me. Um, what I do remember is that the first day of class fell on Yom Kippur and he and I were both fasting. And so that's always been this kind of like secret memory of fellowship over the years. So Jeff, I mean, this has been an incredible year for you with these two books on Shakespeare and, you know, our time, Trump and now Game of Thrones. What's next for you? I've had these very kind of of the moment projects that, that have taken up some of my attention recently. And I'm interested in kind of uh, reconnecting with some of those scholarly roots that we worked on in, in Irvine. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to bring that Richard III book to life. Uh, I'm hoping to bring the, the follow up to that, which is a book called Stigma and Shakespeare, which was my dissertation at Irvine and moves from Richard III and disability outward into other identities that are tagged as inferior for different reasons, talking about race, talking about bastardy in some of Shakespeare's plays. Here at Harvard, I've, I've been uh, teaching Hamlet every semester for the past eight years. And so I've got a project that is inventively titled Essays on Hamlet. I, I also recently made the mistake of starting a Hamlet screenplay based on the idea that we don't need to figure out how to cut Hamlet down to, to two hours that now that we've got these platforms like streaming services like Netflix, we can stage Hamlet over the course of 10 hours and, and episodes that happen one after another. So <laughs> this will surely end well. <laughs> I, that's great. I can just see Hamlet, the miniseries, with uh, you as the showrunner. Wow. Well, Jeff, it's always so fun and inspiring to talk to you and um, we'll just have to get back together in six months when we have another book out, okay? 